Good afternoon. Um, it struck me quite recently that uh, coming along to these TED events is actually quite a sedentary occupation. You know, we turn up here and we listen to these visionary speakers, but we basically sit there all day. Well, for the next two minutes, we're going to change that. But I need your help, okay? So I'd like you to stand up. Thank you. Easy stuff to start with, okay? I want to hear a long sigh from everybody. Put your hand on your chest so you can hear your, your chest vibrate. A long sigh. Ah. Now, come on, you can do better than that. Ah. Okay, this is your next task. Hey, hey, mo pakoni wo shwe. Everybody. That's pretty good, actually. Once more. Hey, hey, Right, this is my part. A quele makole mo pakoni wo shwe. Come on, big voices. I once had the, the, um, the pleasure of having Her Imperial Highness, the Empress of Japan, in the audience, and she did it with great skill and, and great commitment. I expect nothing less from you, okay? <laughs> so, a quele makole mo pakoni wo shwe. Again, a quele makole mo pakoni wo shwe. Next bit. Mo paikoni wo shwe, 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 mo paikoni. Big voices. Pretend you're Pavarotti. Mo paikoni wo shwe. Right, let's do the whole song. A quelle maikole, mo paikoni wo shwe. A quelle mai colle, mo pai coni wo shwe. Hey, hey, mo pai coni wo shwe. Mo pai coni wo shwe, everybody wo shwe. Mo pai coni wo shwe, mo pai coni wo shwe. Mo pai coni wo shwe, mo pai coni wo shwe. Mo pai koni wo shwe, mo pai koni wo shwe. You have to turn. O quelle mai kole, mo pai koni wo shwe. O quelle mai kole, mo pai koni wo shwe. Mo pai koni wo shwe, 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 mo pai koni wo shwe. Mo pakoni wo shwe, mo pakoni wo shwe. A quelle magole, no, okay, we we'll, we'll stop at that, okay? Sit down, please. How does that make you feel? Thank you. Is that the sense of achievement with that? Or is it just, oh no, that man's going to make us sing? You know, that's it, isn't it? It's funny, when you get people to sing like this, it's almost as if you've asked somebody to get out of the sofa and run a hundred meter dash, you know, suddenly. Um, it's, it's an interesting little song. It comes from Ghana. It's a, a children's song from Ghana. And uh, the translation of it is, Come and play, Makole. Makole is the name of the child. And it's not about, come and play with my Xbox. It's not, come and play with my latest video game. It's, come and be curious. Let's go outside. Let's see what there is out there. Let's explore. It's also a song that will only work if, you're, if you stand up and you're counting, you're counted, you know, you have to take part. And it's also a song that I use quite often with some of the work I do with young people around the world. I work in a lot of, of, of cities running music projects. So in a kind of a way, it's, it's a nice metaphor for t today, isn't it? It's about standing up and being counted, it's about gaining knowledge, you know, and, and, and uh, just, just this whole idea of, of doing things together. Um, but I'm really here today, actually, to talk about Information technology, old information technology, actually quite ancient information technology. And song is part of that. Because song, particularly traditional song, is a response to the world about us. There's this fantastic musical chronicle of our relationship with the natural world, 
which is, is, is there through song. You think of all those terrific sea songs, the sea shanties which help sailors go around the Cape of Good Hope. You think of the songs which are sung by the Aboriginal peoples in Australia to help them navigate across these enormous distances in the outback. There are songs about um, uh, the, the birds and the animals out there. You think of all the, the songs that come from the Native Americans about eagles and buffalo. The, the common thing about all these songs is that they're collective. We sing them together. Most of the music we listen to today is about individualism. Most of the music we get through the music industry. But these songs are about doing things together and experiencing things together. Building a culture, maintaining that culture. Creating these social relationships. And heritage is very important in them too. There was a recent research project undertaken by a linguist, uh, Dr. Stephen Pax Leonard, uh, in, right up at the tip of Greenland, uh, looking into the heritage and the spoken traditions of the Inuit. And they have tremendous challenges up there, as we know, from climate change, and also it's, it's a point in the globe where there are tremendous mineral resources that people want to exploit. And the effect on their culture is considerable, particularly their spoken culture. And what uh, Stephen Leonard said was that the spoken tradition is like an orchestra of voices that reaches down into our minds. And if we lose it, we lose our music, we lose our poetry, and we lose the knowledge that's contained within those. And once it's gone, it's gone. Joe Campbell, the uh, mythologist, said it uh, in a much more succinct way. He said, we lose our myths at our peril. But what about the other side of this information technology matrix that we have? What about the, the source of this information? Because the natural world has this abundant richness of information. And it's immediate and it's visceral. We can tell whether there is a creature that is in pain, in distress. We can tell if they're looking for a mate. We can tell if it's a territorial cry. We can tell if it's a predator or if it's a friend. And the habitats themselves are also, they have the same sorts of qualities of sound. We've given you some today actually, uh, in, in, in this auditorium. Uh, we recorded some special uh, habitats for World Wildlife Fund for this uh, particular event, just to give you a flavor of some of those habitats. And, you know, walking in a forest is quite different from walking across a snow, f snow field. And there are sounds for different sorts of snow. I must admit, in a, in a rather mischievous moment when we were preparing those soundtracks, I did wonder whether or not we could put the, uh, the sound of uh, rattlesnakes in the restrooms. Um, I don't think there have been any cues, let's put it that way. <laughs> We've done that. Um, but also, um, quite often, uh, the sounds that we hear, we don't really see the creatures that are making those sounds. They're distant, aren't they? You know, you think of the whale song and things uh, you know, that used to be really popular about 20, 30 years ago. You don't see the whales, but the sounds they make are many, many miles away. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been into uh, an anechoic chamber. It's a very special room that's designed that uh, sucks away all the sounds around us. And all we're left with is the sound of our heartbeat and our nervous system. It's actually quite frightening because you suddenly realize how much information you're taking in through your ears, how much locational information, what is around us. And once that has gone, you know, it's really frightening. And our ears, our hearing, is always turned on. You know, it's like our early warning system. We can sleep, we can close our eyes, but our hearing is still working. And Murray Schaefer, the, the, com the composer, and uh, maybe I can call him a sonic environmentalist, because he was the first person that started looking at this relationship with the, the sounds of the, our environment. He said, we have, ear we have eyelids, but we don't have earlids. It's always on. Well, 
I get involved in quite a number of, of, of projects around the world using music, uh, particularly with young people. And one I've been running for the past couple of years with inner city uh, children uh, is a, a very eco-friendly piece. I use the, um, the Four Seasons, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Um, and I don't know if you all know the Vivaldi Four Seasons. It's kind of one of those pieces that people love to put in elevators, you know, or on call waiting systems. And for those of you who don't know it, it starts like this. Okay? So that's a start. Thank you. Oh, if only it was that easy. <laughs> uh, normally I would say something like, just, just throw paper, coins damage the varnish. All right? <laughs> but thank you. Um, what happens after that beginning is really, it's an exploration of 18th century Italian countryside. This is what Vivaldi intended. And we start with the dawn chorus. And the first bird sound is like this. The next one is... Another one. Another. And. So we've got about 15 bird calls in there. Now, when we work with young people, we give them this idea about going out away from the cities and, it, and thinking what sounds they might hear early in the morning in the countryside. Generally, it's the case we get a list that comes back something like ringtones, alarm clocks, my father snoring. <laughs> Fathers seem to snore all over the world. Well, it's kind of what dads do, isn't it, really, I suppose. And there's an amusing side to that, but there's a slightly worrying side to that, because those are the sounds that inner-city children hear. They are completely distant from sounds of nature, generally. Instead, they have these very... Uh, challenging and brutal sounds of the city, which are dominated by the sounds of traffic and largely digital music. These ambient sounds which are tremendously loud all the time. And we see people with these white cords coming out of their ears. You know, and they themselves are actually listening to this manufactured music in some ways as a buffer against the environments around them. And there is some research that's been done about the use of personal stereos, which suggests that this use of personal stereo means that people are becoming less critical about the sounds around them. And so sounds are getting louder in cities. And another piece of research talks about how people are having to move their homes because of the noise of neighbours. And there's an increasing number of people having to move because the sounds are getting much louder. Um, and of course, with this migration to cities, this means that this disconnection with nature and the world around us is only going to get worse, and our young people are not going to come into contact with those sounds at all. Even the sounds that we had in cities of, of, of nature are diminishing. There was a report done about uh, a, a few years back that said for the past th uh, 30 years in UK cities, there has been a 68% fall in the house sparrow population. And it's because of change of habitat. So we don't hear house sparrows chirruping in London. No such thing as a cockney sparrow anymore in London. That's gone. It's not just in Britain. There's lots of other cities as well. So I've, I've listened to a number of these fantastic presentations today. And it struck me that you know, we're, we're trying to measure the impact that we're having on the environment. And we try to find ways to, to measure it. One thing I don't think we really ever look at is the impact that the sounds of nature and the sounds of the world around us have on us as, as human beings. There is some interesting research that has come into uh, play quite recently about how sound affects us generally as human beings, how it affects our cognition, how it affects our physiology, how it affects our emotions. Uh, the anthropologists are suggesting that our connection with the basic elements of music could go as far back as two million years, and predate referential speech. So music, the sounds around us, the stimuli from the natural world are immensely important. So my final thought for today is that we spend a lot of time observing nature, but I think we should actually start 
to emphasize how important listening to nature is as well. It's important to us as human beings. It's certainly important that we actually bring our young people into contact with those sounds. And more than that, it's important for the natural world around us. Thank you very much.